I think we live. Yeah, we are live now. Welcome, welcome, Antoine. Thank you. And we have a special guest today. Call you on Björk. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I don't know about special, but thank you for that. <laughs> <clears throat> so wh where should we start? You, you, you're pr kind of a Swedish Hall of Famer. Well, I don't know about that either, but um, since this is a football podcast, let's start with football, right? Yeah. So when did I started playing? I started playing way back in uh, I don't remember even what year it was. Maybe it's '95 or something. 1900s, that is. <laughs> and uh, that was uh, at the age of 13. Okay. And with uh, a local little club just north of Stockholm called Tabby Flyers. And uh, they had a little youth. Um, youth run where you know they try to get a youth team going under 16 and uh, they came they went around to nearby schools and recruited and at my first practice I was I was sold I had tried out like soccer hockey karate badminton you name it everything I thought it was kind of boring and first practice of football um, I was sold right away so then I just started playing Nice. So when? So how? How quickly um, into uh, American football did you realize, like, hey, I'm actually pretty good at this? I mean, it depends. I mean, as a teenager, you're kind of confident. Yeah. But you know, in hindsight, I think it was closer to like uh, when uh, with the national team, like under 19. Okay. Um, I realized that was kind of good since. Um, I made it. Yeah, the national team and the under nineteen group, and then also uh, back then there was a thing called Team Europe. I don't know if you heard about it before. Uh, it was a high school aged all star team from Europe, and they gather all from all over Europe, obviously. And you would head over to the U.S. to the Super Bowl town, wherever the Super Bowl was held, yeah. two weeks prior to the Super Bowl, and you would play. I think it was Canada, Mexico, and North America and Japan in the tournament. Okay. Um, but uh, the difference was when it came to, to skill, the the American team was only from one county. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of interesting. <laughs> but uh, all of others were you just gather all from over Europe, all the best talent, and then Japanese and Mexico, Mexico and, and Canada. So when I got um, the possibility to go to one of those tryouts and I made that team, I guess I realized I was I was kind of good. Nice. So that Europe thing does not exist anymore, obviously. I don't. I'm not that updated, but um, I don't think it does. It got canceled, uh, <laughs> and they they switched it. So in every, for a couple of years, it was instead of an All Star Europe team, it was the the team, the national team that won the European Junior Championships. So like, say if Sweden would have won, they would have gone and joined the tournament. Okay. Uh, um, but I, I don't think it's active anymore. Unfortunately, because it sounds like a great experience yeah, it for does. a young camp. Yeah. It was. It was. It was the several camps down in Germany, and then we head over to uh, whatever Super Bowl town it was, and we were there for uh, two weeks before the actual game started. And the first week was a training camp uh, at, in in the U.S., and then uh, we stayed with like the host high school or whatever it was just a good experience uh, man, you did not go to Disneyland or something like that it wasn't like yeah, a no time that was uh way back when uh, I don't know if you know about the NFL Academy that's led by Tony Allen yeah he he was the head coach all of those years he was one of the founders of that team and that initiative and the first thing he said I remember so clearly like when we landed I think the first year was in Tampa and we had training camp in Orlando, okay. and he said, "Welcome to Orlando. It's a beautiful place. A lot of nice places to visit. Sorry, you're not going to see any of it. <laughs> Practice starts in two minutes, <laughs> so okay. we didn't see anything really. We just—it was kind of intense. Two days the first week, and then the second week was only one practice a week, which is kind of a shock for European players, um, since, I mean, uh, you guys both know since playing over here, I mean it's." Is not connected to school or anything, and you, you practice after hours. Yeah. So, doing that way was kind of a shock for all the European players. Okay. Well, you were you still a linebacker then? Yes. Well, back back then in, in Sweden, I did I played multiple positions. 
but um, mostly linebacker and running back and fullback. <clears throat> because did other Swedish players make it to that Euro team? Oh yeah, we were like a group of we were rolling deep. We were like six or seven of us. Okay. So Sweden was popping back then. Well, yeah, it was mostly Germans, politics. <laughs> but, uh, no, the Germans were good. They were all good. But we had a, a, a good steady uh, group of, uh, of Swedish players. It was Ola Rugeland, it was um, Patrick Lundqvist and his brother, uh, Magnus Lundqvist. It was, uh, before I was there, it was also, I think, Joachim Holm was there as well, the year before me. I can't really remember. A couple of years, but he's older than me, I think. He's another generation. I'm going to get shit for this. But, uh, yeah, it was, we were a bunch of guys. And also, um, Mike Anderson. And we had Chris also, who was the quarterback, starting quarterback. Um, we were a bunch. Nice. Oh, Johan Wienberg from Orlando. Uh, the old Jets. We were a bunch of guys going over. Nice. So, was that tournament that put you on the map as a, like, okay, this guy is good up from Sweden? Well, I believe it was because all those coaches that was invo involved in the Team Europe, like all the position coaches and all that, they sooner became coaches in the NFL Europe. So Tony Allen was later on head of NFL International and the na so-called National Scouting because they called all European natives or whatnot. Uh, they called them nationals, uh, not even only Europeans. They called uh, everybody that was non-North American. So all the Japanese guys, Mexican guys. Wherever you were in the world, except North America, you were called national. Okay. So they had a national program with a bunch of national tryouts. It's uh, the program is actually still alive, um, but not in that sense. I think it's an international pathway program. Yeah. We got like Efi Obada was a part of it, and um, a couple of other guys. I can't really name drop them right now. I can't really remember, but a couple of guys that made it uh, in the league right now. It was the same kind of program uh, back then, but it also included the whole NFA Europe League. Okay. So you had like a a uh, spring league where you could showcase your skills. They don't have that no more, but since you know it folded in 07. But, uh, so you had a chance to play in NFA Europe and get a chance to move on. Yeah. So where did your, uh, where did your football journey take you kind of after that? After Team Europe, yeah, it was. Uh, I was. I wasn't. I didn't really realize that it could actually get me anywhere. I think the first time I was part of that for two years or two seasons, whatnot, two trips, and then um, uh, I think after the first season or first, no, the second one, when I became a true senior in Swedish football, when you're over 19, mm -hmm. I switched teams from uh, Tabby Flyers to Stockholm Me Machines. Okay, uh, that must have been in 2000 or 2001. And uh, I played with them for three years. Um, we had a, a fairly good team in those three years. We won the national championships twice. Nice. Uh, 02 and 04, I think. Yeah, my first year was 02. Okay. And then after 04, um, I went to NFA Europe <clears throat> uh, with the Admirals for three seasons. Okay. And then. Uh, Where was that team located, then? Well, actually. To give a little bit of history, way back when, when they actually founded the league, Amsterdam, uh, the team actually stayed downtown, but the players couldn't handle it, mm. and for obvious reasons. Yeah. So they moved <laughs> where they lived to a student town, like maybe 45 minutes an hour with train outside of Amsterdam okay. to a little city called Utrecht. 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 And um, it was a really nice town. It was like Amsterdam miniature Amsterdam but without all the other stuff yeah. uh, that comes with it so it, it was unreal apparently I wasn't there for that but uh, also when the you know the other teams came to Amsterdam it was it wasn't like yeah it wasn't kosher so they had <laughs> nobody to went there. through the drug test <laughs> I don't think uh, okay this is this is what the myth says and the story says I wasn't a part of it so I don't know but they say that that was the biggest home field advantage for the Amsterdam. Oh yeah, because all the players, guesting <laughs> the the guest teams would come the night before, and they would go out. So, mm. the first and second quarter, they were still so out of it because they've been doing drugs, yeah. and uh, 
the third That's quarter the was a team. So as soon as they got up in the first and second quarter, they would win. But uh, I don't know. I can't confirm <laughs> it. But that's what all the guys said that, that, that was there at the time. That's crazy. <laughs> crazy. Kind of understandable. I visited the Netherlands. It's Some of those things are kind of crazy. Yeah, they're, they're different. It's a good time, though. Yeah. Yeah. So from, from NFL Europe, how did you kind of make your uh, pathway into the NFL? Well, uh, the the international pathway program that I told you about earlier that uh, a couple of guys are a part of now, mm-hmm. it was kind of in the in its womb or whatever, or however you you would uh, yeah, it's, explain that it was it's just starting yeah. up. So I think a year or two before I started uh, playing with the Admirals and for Europe, it was four guys, four Europeans or four non-Americans that were offered a practice squad uh, spot. Okay with uh, an NFL team and then my year it expanded to, to six or eight I think it was eight guys so uh, that first year after Amsterdam I got a call from uh, Kansas City Chiefs nice. and they wanted me to come to their camp uh, unfortunately they didn't realize I was in Sweden and they needed one they needed a camp body mm. so they needed somebody come right away so I didn't have the possibility to get there so I was kind of disappointed, but after the second year, I got uh, a possibility to go with the uh, Dallas Cowboys on their practice squad. That was in uh, the season of 2006. Okay. So, pretty much that. And then I w- went with the Cowboys in season 06, the full season for uh, a practice squad pl- uh, spot. So what, what's that? What that moment kind of like for people to understand? Like, if you're a, if you're a football player in Europe, and then you're kind of you know that you're going to be on an NFL practice squad and you know you're going to get to wear that NFL team's colors and the possibility of you making a roster is it's now it's becoming slightly a reality. So what, what's that moment kind of like? Well, it was kind of... I really had no way to, to you know, uh, prepare myself mm-hmm. for it. The best preparation I had playing-wise and culture-wise was two seasons with the Admirals. Mm-hmm. Since, I mean, it was so set up, it was it was a really tight organization, and um, it was uh, the way NFL Europe was set up. It was it was ten games, uh, and the two best teams went to play the World Bowl, uh, which 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 was the eleventh game, if you were lucky to have the best record. Uh, and it was really just, I mean, you had a training camp that was like a month before that, so all in all, it was like. A compressed 14 or 15 week season uh, but those guys that were with that team I mean it was 95 96 percent Americans and they were all like NFL caliber a bunch of them was even drafted in the first round okay. and maybe didn't make the team uh, and such and they were sent over to, to NFL Europe to, to prove themselves uh, and get good film on them and have, have a chance to get back on the NFL roster didn't so James Harrison why, play NFL Europe? one more time James Harrison was an NFL Europe player, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. So there are some big-ass names. A guy named Kurt Warner. I don't know if you heard yeah. him. Yeah, Kurt him. Warner. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he used to There's buy a bunch of guys. There's a bunch of guys. He was actually with the Admirals also, Kurt Warner. Hmm. Also, um, uh, Walter Payton's son, Jared Payton. Okay. Uh, played with the Admirals together. He's a cool guy. Um, a bunch of other guys. I mean, uh, maybe not a lot of guys that you... Think about right away, but like a safety call, it's Tar Bigby. His name is Tar Bigby. It's not called. His name is Tar Bigby. He won the Super Bowl with the Packers later on. Uh, a bunch of guys. There's a bunch of really good uh, football players that's been in NFL Europe and then took it one step further. Hmm. Unfortunately, it closed down. Yeah, it was bad, man. It's all Roger Goodell's fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but uh, back to the question. Um, uh, playing wise. And if Europe gave me a group preparation, mm-hmm. uh, and then when I went over, it was one notch up as of competitiveness and the culture, because all the Americans that came to Europe, you know, is the team was pretty much American. So you got all the American culture and also the competitiveness that you hadn't been exposed to before as a European, because mm-hmm. uh, it's it's really a different animal, yeah. like how the competitiveness is and the attitude. Uh, even though, like, I mean, you, you're pretty much more friends with another position group 
than you are in your own position. And that's like unheard of in European football. Yeah. Because in European football, this, the guys on your position, they're your yeah, brothers. Yeah. But uh, in the NFL or in that level, and if Europe also at a higher level with the American attitude and the American athletes, I mean, before, they don't care about you. And that was a, that was a big awakening for me when coming to NFL Europe. So I like, kind of knew that. But that, the NFL was a notch higher. Okay. Um, and also, in general, like, all the players were good. Like, in NFL Europe, you can get a couple of so-so players. Yeah. But, I mean, in NFL, I mean, the biggest biggest thing that that was such a shock for me was pretty much playing-wise was the O-line mm -hmm. and the cornerbacks. Watching them play, like, seeing how violent an O-line can be at that weight and that size and being that fast and being that smart at the same time that was a shock and also the cornerbacks it was it was just ridiculous seeing them move yeah. how fast it's almost like they predict what the wide receiver is going to do um that was like popped out a lot compared to nfl okay uh, what was your welcome to the film moment who gave it to you who gave it to me hmm there's a bunch of of them like um, the worst one was probably like the first like I didn't know about this was um, my second day at in the um, in the Cowboys facilities and um, Bill Parcells who was the head coach then talked to me and he said he like he didn't talk to me he talked to the person that was next to me and asked the person next to me if I talk talk English so I responded to him courteously and politely uh, yes I speak English and then he asked again like okay does he know about the conditioning test and I didn't know about the conditioning test and all, since I came in so late all the guys had done the mini camps and the OTAs and whatnot had trained for the conditioning test but I got there two days before camp okay so I didn't know about the conditioning test so I just you know been doing football stuff so it was 300 yard shuttles uh, timed of course position position wise and Parcells was a really, a lot of people know, know who he is, but he's an old school coach. And he's going to use the conditioning test as an example. He's not going to be soft. If somebody's not making that, he doesn't care who you are. He's going to find you or cut you. Um, so knowing that, I was kind of nervous. Uh, and it was horrendous because, I mean, we didn't have training camp in, in, in Dallas. But I went out on Dallas practice field because it was the day before the conditioning test. And I thought, I have to feel it at least. So I tried it out and I was like, oh, there's just no way. And then we went to a uh, training camp in Oxnard, California. Obviously with your own charter jumbo jet. Uh, that's the only way to yeah. fly. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the next day we had the conditioning test. And it, it, was, it was probably the worst thing I ever uh, did. Uh, like conditioning wise because I wasn't really prepared for mm. it and it's the first time I ever encountered not being physically prepared for something um, I took pride in always being physically prepared strength wise, speed wise, anything and also mentally uh, but that was, you know, nobody knew me uh, nobody knew who I was I spoke um, like better English than I do now like no accent whatsoever so nobody really knew I was from another country um, and they you know it was it was kind of weird because um, I don't think I told this story before but uh, when you came to Dallas as a rookie or a first-year player they don't give you the star on the helmet right away mm. until you make the team so I was in the first year locker room during training camp not a part of the, all the others like the veterans and stuff but like the first-year guys and the, the rookies even though you're a free agent during the first... I don't know if they do this hierarchy thing anymore with when Parcells isn't there, but that was a thing when, you, when I was there. And they would not put your star on the helmet until you made a team. But when I came, I already had a star on my helmet. Okay. So that already turned some heads, even before the conditioning camp, because all the organization knew that I was... I signed a practice squad deal, and I can get into the details of that right in a minute, but... It pretty much meant I was going to be on the press squad for that remainder of the year. So they put the star on my helmet. Okay. But that, you know, 
I guess that kind of didn't fall well with some people, yeah. which I realized later down the season when I talked to them. But, you know, and then you do the conditioning test and you barely don't make it and you just, you know, gasping for air. So that was kind of my first welcome to the NFL moment. The other one that was kind of worse, uh, more like being pretty much beat up uh, as a linebacker is like they played a 3-4 stack um, uh, defense which was old school because the inside linebacker which I was uh, positioned as are three yards off the guard and uh, usually you're like three yards off the ball or five yards off the ball whatever system you're playing depending on what kind of play or whatnot you don't have to get into details but it's an uncovered guard and you're expected to be able to take the guard head on and shed him off and work two gaps pretty much depending on what kind of defense is called so pretty much the first play I line up it was bunch I mean since I was way down in the depth chart I didn't get any regular reps for a pretty long time I was you know pretty much just a camp body and just running around on special teams and doing all the drills and do being a look team and whatnot but later on as the training camp went on uh, if you know, if you've been watching Hard Knocks, you know everybody, you know, they have yeah. rest days. And the less number it gets, and they want their starters to have fresh legs and everybody else to have fresh legs for the preseason games. They send the, 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 the cannon fodder or whatnot. So you step in and you're linebacker and going up against the starting O-line and they do it like a inside zone right away and you got a, you know, 300 pound guard coming down. And uh, yeah, I was, I was pancaked right Oof. away. It was, I just had to, I just had to realize <laughs> that I had to bring my 100% every time, all the time, and even more. Yeah. So that was, it was, it was also one of those times, you know, look on tape afterwards and it was, please get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, and, uh, getting pancaked in the NFL doesn't sound that bad. Like, people getting pancaked in Sweden. So yeah. Getting pa pancaked by an NFL guard is not a <laughs> shameless thing. It just, it's just so much more intense. It's just like I've been painted in Sweden everywhere. I've been blindsided everywhere, but just the violence of it. Because it's not like I went in like lollygagging and like not doing my yeah. all and not even making an effort. I mean, this was pretty much my first snap with the starting defense against the starting offense, and I was jacked up obviously, and I was giving it my all into that guard, and he took me and he violated me and he put me on the ground and laughed and walked away. Laughed and walked so, yeah, that part. That, yeah. that's the difference i mean it's not like he caught me off guard yeah. or like i wasn't ready i was ready and i gave him my all and he buried me so that was that was the difference it's it's, it's the laughing and the walking away that would have cut me deep like I'm yeah like, oh, you know what okay <laughs> so uh kind of explain what's it like being because you didn't just go to any team in america you went to the dallas cowboys which is america's team and as, yep. as much as I dislike the Cowboys, like, my dad is a humongous Cowboys fan, but, like, I just, I, it's just something about them that I just can't get behind. So what was it like being a part of that organization and walking around that facility and being around those group of people and, you know, Jerry Jones and all that stuff? It was great. It was, um, they're all professionals. Uh, I was a part of a couple of other teams that wasn't really that professional. Uh, but it was interesting to see it, like, that extreme. Mm -hmm. And also how they're treated uh, like if you're a Dallas Cowboy in Dallas you're treated that way even me who was a no-name and you know nobody knew who I was if they even gotta you know know that I was on the roster uh, they would treat me differently you would get discounts you would get deals you would get offers you would get things for free just for being a Dallas Cowboy and I mean there's no things as lines, waiting times, um, anything. Like, it didn't really matter. Um, you just got the, the quick lane all nice. the time. Um, and all, you know, you would be sitting there at a restaurant with some teammates and people would come over. They would offer to, 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 to buy your meal, to pay for it. They would talk about fantasy football. <laughs> like, you know, it was, it was weird. It was, it was weird. But it was also really interesting since I I was a part of a team with players that been that all their life. And I came from a different background. I came from a blue collar job. I used to work as an electrician. I also been a fireman doing army duty. And having a whole different life before I got here 
which made, gave me a whole different view of this and a different perspective. So it was really interesting to be with people next to me that was acting like that was normal. Because they've done that in college and also in yeah. high school. For them, that was not something unusual. So that was pretty, uh, really cool to see, like how different people are and their backgrounds. But um, as it comes to like Jerry Jones, he's a professional. He was one of the first ones to come greet me, uh, which is kind of weird also. And uh, that was the year when Drew Ble uh, Drew Bledsoe was the quarterback. Um, and also mid-season when Tony Romo took over. So that was also pretty cool to be a part of that. But uh, it was some quarterback controversy, obviously. And it was a lot of hard feelings. Bledsoe didn't take that well. Um, it's also interesting because when I was a part of that, it was when um, Bill Parcells was on his way out. And he was also really honest with it. He would like address the the team and say like I couldn't even coach a group of canines to eat a steak right now. Uh, so he was really like honest and also hard on himself because um, we were not doing good that year. So that was pretty interesting to be a part of. <clears throat> but the re the thing I really confused about is how big of a difference is it or how much of a shock was it going from playing in the meme machines where you pay to play and uh, you, you go home after practice practice twice a week going back going to the NFL is it twice a day maybe then you got physio you got tubs you got everything how was how was that difference that's <laughs> a huge difference of course you guys being a part of that like type of European football when I mean it's at night is always not the best fields you get really bad times um, well the biggest like that and if a Europe, that really gave me the the real exp the first really shock and experience of practicing twice a day and having everything outlined at, around practice and, and looking at yourself every day, watching practice afterwards on tape. So the NFL didn't become as much of a shock for me since I had done the whole... The NFL Europe was just like a mini NFL that treated everything exactly the same. Uh, it was just all the like luxurious things like of the all re really nice weight rooms and the really nice uh, locker rooms and all the other perks with like the food. Everything, you know, since they had so much more money with an NFL franchise, everything was 10 notches up as it comes to like uh, all the around things. But when it came to football, pure football and like practices and all, it was pretty much the same as it was built up. So I had a really good preparation in NFL Europe, but when I came from me machines and also playing with the national team, it was a really leap up to like first come to practice, practice uh, um, the, um, the camp, the practice camp, and then all of a sudden doing two days. I mean, we did two days with the national team way back when, when I think even we did five practice a day sometimes wow. with some crazy ass head coaches uh, way back then. I'm not going to drop <laughs> any names, but uh, uh, then. Um, when you come to the NFL Europe and it's like everybody's good um, and you're doing two days and it's competition and it's you're not done when you're done with practice you're having meetings and you're watching yourself correcting every mistake taking notes on yourself every day that was the biggest difference and then when you came to the NFL it was just more fine-tuned yeah. but it, it was a big leap it was a big leap for sure and also one of the biggest things playing wise as a linebacker in Sweden you didn't really with all due respect you really didn't need to drop the pass <laughs> I mean you could but you didn't I didn't me as a player I didn't understand the concept of all the coverage gotcha. I knew the difference from from like zone coverage to man coverage and where I'm supposed yeah. to be but it's a whole different level like you don't have time to take a wrong step. You don't have time to do anything wrong for even a split second. You need to know where you're supposed to be. You need to be there now. Um, so that was a big thing, adding all to that, like how active a linebacker needs to be in the pass coverage, uh, which was also really big with the NFL Europe um, way back when. And then also with the NFL was even one level yeah. higher. That pretty much it. So uh, I got. I have a question. Um, so you, 
when you first went to the Dallas Cowboys, you had a you had a guaranteed practice spot for the whole season, right? So, mm-hmm. uh, can you explain? So you got to see like the business of football. So can you kind of explain like how the business of football works for like uh, players being traded and how much that weighs on like the players, like you know, mental uh, ability or capacity, kind of. It's huge. I mean, that it's um it's kind of hard to explain. It's very emotional. Um, you see, not only veterans, but first year guys, second year guys, third year guys. You see the look in your eyes because you know they know. A lot of people are really self, uh, like, they know what mm-hmm. they've done, and they know it's not good enough. Uh, so they kind of know already that they're going to get cut, but there's still that little hope yeah. left that they're not, that they're going to make it anyway. Uh, it's huge. I mean, the mental thing, the guys that run around there and being worried are the guys that are going to get cut. Gotcha. Um, it was really pretty much the the thread through my whole mm-hmm. like career and viewing it actually three different times with three different teams, seeing that the guys that were really worried all the time were the guys that usually always got cut and the guys that would be a, could be able to separate, like it's the last year of the deal or they're right on the brink of yeah. getting cut. It could just put that all to the side and really focus on just just the performing and think, thinking about football. They would make it. But it was devastating because a lot of guys, I mean, they put their life and soul into that. They had no plan B whatsoever yeah. and uh they might have even gotten some money through their from the draft or whatnot and they already spent it all um they knew they were going to be broke the second they were cut they didn't even know what where to go or where to begin so it was it was when i say it was life and death it really was because it wasn't always also it wasn't just about football or a dream of football or becoming an nfl mm-hmm. player it was food on the table and it was a future uh, that they, they they didn't know what to do. Uh, they were a football player through and through, and nothing else. So they they couldn't even see themselves doing anything uh, else. Yeah. So it, it's it not was, like you it can apply really... for a new job when you get cut. It's not like a normal job because if I lose my job, I can just apply for a new place. Yeah, yeah. And then it it's not like I'm I got my apply for Tampa Bay. I think they're looking for linebacker. <laughs> yeah. No man, you need to fall back on something different. Yeah. And then uh, I mean. A lot of people since, I mean, you guys know in, in, in the U.S., if you've been a star in high school and college, you probably haven't really, everybody around you has made you think that it's about yeah. you. Yeah, for sure. And everybody around you has made you think, uh, not only are you hyped up, but they hype you up, your family, yeah. your friends. Um, and they only view you as a football player as well. So yeah. uh, it's hard for them to don't just like I talked to some guys and they the, the the thing they fear the most is to come home to their closest family and tell them that they didn't make it because they get critiqued and they get like really harsh feedbacks so to speak speak because they were like the hope of yeah. the family to make it so it's like it's it's so harsh for them it's not like they could come home and like get a regular job as an accountant or whatnot yeah that's not acceptable and uh, it's just in Europe or in Sweden it's not like you could really understand that you can talk mm-hmm. about it but it's really hard to really fathom like how how brought up they are to, to get where they are to that day because yeah. like they've been doing everything for their whole life and only focusing on one thing and that's not gonna happen so it, it, it's it's um, was that a it's comfort a for you knowing? Was that a comfort for you knowing, like, worst case scenario, I go back, stay a fireman or stay an electrician, and play for Stockholm? That's the worst case scenario. I never thought about it that way. I uh, I was there to prove myself. I wasn't, you know, I didn't join the team to ride shotgun or like be an exemption or anything like that. My attitude was never ever to just be in exemption on a roster or a practice squad spot i if you meet anybody that every practice with me even in the nfl they would tell you i'm a hard worker no doubt in my mind 
because I would never, ever take a rep off or take anything off. So my goal was always to make the team, whichever team I was with, I was going to make the team and I was going to be the best one. Uh, so I adopted that mentality early and uh, it was never a comfort for me knowing that I had a job back in Stockholm because that was yeah. never my goal. That was never what I wanted. That was not what I aspired to do. So also being in that environment, it it's contagious. Uh, that like the competitiveness and where you want to go. So like, I never found comfort. Like thought it was more of a fear for me. Like, honestly, to be like, hey, if I don't make it, I can go and be an electrician again. That was like, that didn't yeah. exist. So it was the opposite for you. Like you, you were oh, scared yeah. to go back to being an electrician. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. You can get shocked, man. <laughs> <laughs> Climbing those tall ladders, man. <laughs> Hell no. So, uh, what what are um, what are some things that you would tell, like the Swedish player or a European player, uh, to kind of start adopting now, earlier in their career, so that will help them in the long run, uh, if they get their opportunity to make it on an NFL roster. Get off social media. Stop posting highlights all the time. Your PRs, nobody cares. It's all about your ego. And just do the work. Yeah. Just do the work. There's so many ways now that you... I'm not saying you're not supposed to post your highlights when you've got a great... The way you should, like, if you have an agent or the European agent yeah. that works now, and the way you should put your name out there and you should perform. Don't get me wrong. But focus on putting the work down. Do everything the hard way first. Because there's no easy way. Because when you get there, if you ever get to the top, wherever near the top, no one there will care or what you've yeah. done before. It's only what you can do there. And all the work that you've done before is going to lead you up to that. So it's going to be a harsh reality if you get to the top or whatnot and you think that the work you did is going to be... I mean, the work you did to get to the national team isn't going to be the same thing as the work you you do to stay in the gotcha. national team. You have to yeah. get better. So when you get to the NFL or college or whatever your goals are, whatever the next level is, you can never be content. You can, of course, be happy and proud mm -hmm. of yourself, but don't get content and complacent and think that you made it if your goal is to get to the next step. But if your goal is to stay where you are, Sure, get content and be happy about that. But usually that leads to yeah. bitterness in the very end. But pretty much just do the hard work. And there's no easy way. There's no connection. There's nobody you can find that could help you along the way except you. Because you're the only one in the, when, when the day is over and you lay your head on the pillow, you're the only one being responsible to you. So don't rely on anybody else. Do the hard work yourself. And... Uh, the good thing will come uh, to you. Don't be question. bitter or uh, so point fingers towards it, anybody else. Uh, uh, on your journey, was it more difficult uh, making it on an NFL roster or trying to stay on an NFL roster? You, we, I think we lost connection for a second there in my rambling. You said something about making yeah, an yeah. NFL so, roster. So for you, uh, in your journey, was it difficult making it to the NFL or was it difficult trying to stay in the NFL? and uh, earn a roster spot? It was more difficult to stay. Um, my goal was never to, like, to just kind of explain if anybody, like, um, I was on mm -hmm. three practice squads. All same deals. And roster exemption, uh, being the only thing that I could be, there was no, like, thing in my deal that would be, like, you can make an active roster this year, it would always be okay. the next year. So even if they had a thousand injuries, there were like no probable way I would be activated if I wouldn't if they wouldn't like tear my contract up, make a new one and just, you know, okay. start from scratch. So it was an NFL international deal. The deal nowadays with the guys that go over now at the, the same program, but a bunch of bunch of years later, they are able to okay. get activated. So that's the difference uh, then from now. Um, 
but my goal was never to be the roster exemption or anything like that. So the hardest thing for me to accept was after my first year with the Cowboys. I talked to them and they said like, yeah, we'll, we'll keep an eye on you. I talked to Parcells at the end of the day and he said, if I'm here, you're here, which is kind of big for me since Parcells was a, you know, yeah. a big coach back then. I still, still is. He didn't continue uh, with the Cowboys and I don't know if I could have taken that for face value. Even though if, if I would got an invitation to camp, I still would have had to make the work and make the roster on my own. Uh, so that wouldn't maybe even would have happened if he would have stayed. I don't even know since it didn't happen, so it doesn't matter. But the hardest thing for me was kind of like accepting that I didn't mm-hmm. make it the first year and go back to NFL Europe and play one more season uh, and then go to the to the Packers afterwards. And then, I mean, the season with the Packers, I mean, I, I had enough like self-realization with the Cowboys that I probably didn't, wouldn't make it. I wasn't mm-hmm. in the right system. I was too small. I wasn't smart enough with the, the defensive system. I didn't know enough football yet. But with the Packers, I was so much better. And uh, I really did everything. And I still believe to this day that I could have made that roster uh, or li- as a linebacker or anything else, like a tight end or a fullback also. Um, but I didn't make it that year either. And by then, the NFL Europe had folded. So then I... Uh, I didn't really know what uh, to do with myself, uh, so I stayed in the U.S. just working out with a buddy, yeah. just trying to, you know, get my tape out there. Had an agent, and he talked with different teams, and I had some dialogue and stuff. But that was probably the hardest thing to to like accept, uh, like that whole yo-yo yeah. thing. You had to go yeah. there and back, and then they kept the program alive with the uh, international practice squad. And Tony Allen called me uh, back in 07 or 08, and he asked if I wanted to be a part of it again. And I didn't really know if I said if I wanted to do it because I really didn't want to be in another exception yeah. another year. I ended up um, after I had a lot, some dialogue with my agent and also with the Packers. Um, they didn't really know if they could bring me in or not during free agent. Um, tryouts to compare me to their other tight end and, and uh, fullback back then uh, they couldn't promise me that uh, so then I took the chance to go back to Europe and I was part of the international camps again and then I got an additional spot with uh, with the Bengals for the last year so yeah I don't know no, if no, that answers your question but... yeah. where were your favorite place which team even Netherlands <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as as like an actual player and not on the practice squad, Amsterdam. I mean, the camaraderie would be built. I mean, a lot of the Americans compared it to college, like, because we had the luck all three years to have a lot of returning players, which was not very common in NFL Europe. Uh, but a bunch of guys uh, actually came back, so the core guys were still left all three seasons. So we had a really good core group. Uh, with the Americans and the Europe or non North Americans nationals, uh, it was a great time. But it, as it comes to the NFL, like Green Bay was by far the best experience. I mean, we went 13 and three that year, so it's not yeah. really hard to be happy. And we, I mean, we were really close to getting to the Super Bowl. We lost to the um, to the Giants in the NFC Championship game, where like they were huge underdogs. Uh, honestly. Like everybody in the organization thought we were already going to Arizona where the Super Bowl was playing. Uh, the Giants was not, was not a threat, but they actually won that game, obviously. And then what they, year was it? It was in 07, so they yeah, won, won the Super Bowl. They won the Super Bowl. Do you guys really it. think you could beat the Patriots that year? <clears throat> well, I mean, the yeah. Giants beat them <laughs> yeah. in the Super Bowl. So why wouldn't the Packers, the 13 3, be able to, to beat them with Brett Favre? Instead of Eli Manning. Was that, was that the year the oh, Patriots uh, went uh, undefeated? Yeah. Yeah, they were undefeated. So um, it was crazy. I was at that Super Bowl, actually. It was awesome. I was sitting there a bunch with a bunch of Giants fans, and they were... I've never experienced anything as intense as a, like, at a, as a fan. They were just screaming, we shocked the world. and It was, it was an amazing experience, actually. Was it a shock going from 
warm ass Dallas to yeah, cold ass yeah. Green Bay. <laughs> Wisconsin. It was. It was. I mean, Dallas. I mean, I think we had frost one time, like for like one hour in the morning. And they were panicking on the roads with, you know, obviously me being from Sweden and was wondering what the fuss was about. But uh, it, the climate was really nice and also the orientation was great. But uh, as it came to food, Green really? Bay was the best. They were, they had their own chefs and they cooked mm. breakfast, lunch and dinner during training camp. I mean, I mean, we had snow crab legs during nice. training camps, man. <laughs> I mean, we were, we were, the, the food was so good. And every morning you come in, I don't know how it is now, but you come in and you make your, you get your custom omelet. You say like, I like three egg whites and two whole eggs and I want that, oh, that, wow. that in there. And, uh, I mean, food wise, it was the best and they treated their players amazing. I mean, there's a reason why, I don't know, since I haven't been a part of the organization, obviously in a bunch of, bunch of years, I'm not even going to count. I don't know how it is now, but back then they really took care of their players and not, not any player really wanted to leave. Uh, because they really treated their players awesome. They treated them well in, in Dallas as well, but, but uh, in Green Bay was a it whole was... other level. What the same kind of treatment by the fans in Green Bay too? Because it's a kind of a big, like, it's, it's massive. In... Oh, it's huge. Area. But, I mean, like, culture-wise, if you yeah, go like... Yeah, like, the Green Bay Packers are massive. Like, were people nice to you there too? You didn't miss that in mean, it was It was great. Um, the, the biggest difference, like, I mean, Green Bay is really small. Um, they don't really have any clubs or anything. You, they have some small places, but like the place that we went when I was there was like a small little bar with a pool table. And I mean, we were really close to the fans. They were really awesome. They, I mean, I wasn't a star, but if you know any star would walk into the bar, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be all on them. They wouldn't be all paparazzi nice. or anything like that. Now, if you went out with when you were in Dallas, I mean, that people would like behave pretty weird compared to how they, I mean, because in Green Bay, they were just a part of, yeah. know, of the city and, you know, they can hang out and talk to people in a regular way. But uh, not in Dallas, man. It was always the back door and, you know, take the back elevator nice. up and uh, VIP and all that good stuff because uh, you couldn't really, you know, move around with other people. But in Green Bay, you were just... It was no problem. You felt normal again? Yeah, felt normal. Because sometimes I feel bad for like famous people. Because <clears throat> like, in uh, some way, we, like, need they feel like really we need to be really clear about that when we say famous people. I was never ever a famous person. But they, I played with superstars. They were they were celebrities pretty much. But even though they got the guys that were really high up, that were superstars from Green Bay, it, they. The, the fans there, since it was so close, I mean, there was, you know, it, they didn't, they weren't all up in their face uh, if they had an uh, opportunity to do so. Um, but in Dallas, I, 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 I experienced that it was that way. So, Like, it feels bad when, like, they get treated like zoo animals. Like, they're sitting and eating with their fans and they see, like, 15 phones around them. Yeah. Come on, he's Well, easy. I had the luck to, you know, <laughs> Social media pretty much didn't exist. I mean, Facebook founded in 07 and smartphones. I mean, the first iPhone came yeah. in 07 as well. So, I mean, somebody going to pick up the Nokia? <laughs> like, I mean, then nobody really, I mean, selfies pretty much didn't yeah. exist back then either. So, those pictures had so many pixels, you could barely see what person it was. It was better not even to take a picture. It was better to draw a picture of your experience than take a picture. And it was a different time. But when would you decide to pack your bags and come home again? When did I decide? I didn't decide. <laughs> yeah, but when like, you thought, like, okay, I'm, I'm going home again. No. It was, uh, I never decided that I wanted to go home. Because um, I, I wasn't really... A, I wasn't ready. I didn't think I would. I had uh, accomplished what I set out to do. Uh, I was with the Bengals in '08, and uh, at the end of the season, there um, we had some dialogue about signing, but they weren't interested. And I stayed there for. I mean, we won. I think we won like four games that year, 
So obviously we didn't go through the playoffs, so the season was then over uh, come January. But I stuck around until at least like June or July. I stayed in the States. Uh, uh, road tripping around and also flying around to go to CFL tryouts. Uh, I had a bunch of talks with old teams like Green Bay especially. Uh, since that, that was where I had the most, best relationship with the organization, also the the scouts. Um, had some dialogue, nothing really happened. Um, and the CFL was hard. I, I thought I was going to be in the CFL for like, I just thought I needed to show up pretty much. Uh, all those tryouts, I, I killed it at all of them. There was really no issue. I never signed. But it was, they have a whole different rules since I mean the Canadian Football League I don't know how it is now but they were really pro local um, own like Canadian citizens um, so so I would I would be counted as an American since I was a, a Swedish guy I would be counted as an import and they didn't want to take the chance even though I was better than someone they rather would stay with a guy that had a three or four or five year college background uh, at an American college with an American coach that they could talk to since I didn't go to college I didn't have that background um, uh, so, it wound up being a lot harder being a part of that CFL than it actually would be a part of the NFL for me. So, then I went back, um, I had an offer from like an arena league, uh, but I wasn't feeling it. That was a whole different sport. So, like Spokane, I think it was, way up in Seattle. So, I, I, I declined that, and then I signed with uh, a German team. Um, Kiel Baltic Hurricanes uh, for the season of <coughs> 09 and I had a dialogue with my old buddy Christian Moore you probably know him he also played NFL Europe but had a really similar journey uh, he was part of NFL Europe and also the International Pathway program he also signed with the Seahawks a real contract uh, for a couple for a season and unfortunately got injured anyway we had a dialogue and we both said that we had some football left in us. We both signed with Kiel and tried to help them to win the national GFL championship. Uh, and that was like, when I was there, I knew. I knew I was done. Uh, I didn't have any inflated idea that I would somehow get any eye from any scout or anybody would talk to me from the NFL ever if I ever left the country. But my visa expired and it would cost me my last savings to actually make it uh, <laughs> uh, still legit so I left and I played in Europe and I you know the first practice I mean they treated me great there was a great team I made some really good friends for life there um, awesome organization as well and uh, they uh, treated me really well but I mean the first practice I came from mahogany you know locker rooms with carpeted really <laughs> nice and you know Nobody made you Washed everything for me. I have my own locker, you know, it's catered to food. And all of a sudden, you know, me and Christian, Christian Moore are standing there at like a like a little grassy knoll and like, where where's the locker room? And they're like <laughs> No, oh, it's just that <laughs> there's no locker room. Like like in broken German English. Oh, no man. locker room. Okay. Where so when did we just get my protein shakes? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Washing so my pads. There, there weren't there were there was, there was no smoothie wow. bar. There were, you know. Anyway, no, it, it wasn't also the like the, all the nice things, but it was really when I realized when I stood there balancing on one leg, trying not to step in wet grass with the other one, you know, trying to just switch my underwear real quick, uh, you know, you know, trying to get my tights on, uh, that I realized yeah. that I'm done. Uh, I'm not going anywhere from this. But obviously, I'm going to put my best effort in this season and, and do everything I said I, I, I was supposed to do. But I knew that season that I was done. Also, watching the game film, I saw myself getting worse okay. and worse for every snap. Because I didn't have to do, I didn't have to challenge myself. Uh, I did not have the best season of my life. I played so much better football before I got there. And I just knew. Um, I'm not going to you know, sign with another European team just to hold on to football. Uh, I'm not going to do that. So... Um, that was uh, my last club football, and then I had a, a last stint in 2010 with the national team in the European Championships in Frankfurt, I think it was. That was great fun. That was great fun. That was fun. How slow motion was football when you came back? It was slow, man. 
It was slow. <laughs> but it was, I mean, it was also going back to roots, pretty much, because the biggest difference, which I felt after my first GFL game, was at this level, people are actually still trying to hurt each other. People are actually still trying to do, they think it's a contact sport, man. Like, obviously, it's a collision sport. The NFL, it hits, and they're really strong, and you tackle each other, and it's full on everything don't get me wrong but all of a sudden again with you know being back in european football i mean, I mean there's a dad like 45 years old you know he's trying to <laughs> twist your knee because you're a good player and that was just surreal to me like what where am i why why are people doing this and i my body after one gfl game was hurting more than it would done under during like six professional seasons like I was I was like, oh yeah, this is what it's about in these leagues. Like w on this level, people are still thinking that you should try to run around and hurt each other. <laughs> um, Isn't that based on you had massages and therapy and the cold tub, warm tub? Listen, you still talk to me like I was some kind of star. I didn't get any massage. I could get a cold tub and a hot tub, and I was if I was hurt, I got treatment. But I didn't get any massage. Oh, you think I was feeding, getting fed grapes or something? <laughs> no, man. But, uh, no, I mean, since, I mean, we got to the GFL and we had a lot of free time, time uh, since obviously we didn't have any work. So we had time to take care of our bodies outside of practice, especially compared to the other guys that we still had a job and, you know, had to do all the things that you had to do in European football. Go to a job, take care of your kids and take care of your family and then go to football practice. We could just chill all day and, you know, go to the gym and take care of our bodies. It was mostly because it was very, very, very physical and the players that you met really tried to, instead of playing football, they tried to hurt you. Did you guys make it to the final that year? We did and we lost. Thanks to for the uh, Unicorns? No, uh, we beat the, un I think it was the Unicorns. Swabish Hall, right? Yeah, I think. We beat the them coach. in the semifinals, like in the last second. We were... We were supposed to lose that game, but we actually won. Uh, it was great coaching and great team effort. And then uh, we lost to Berlin uh, you, in the finals. He, the the defensive coordinator there, our special teams coordinator, was the head coach for a uh, for a couple of years. Oh, really? Aaron. Oh, really? Yeah. We had, we had him on the show. Nice. <laughs> yeah, head coach was... It was kind of fun, though, actually, because the head coach of, the, of Berlin was... Uh, Shuan Fata, which was my linebacker coach in Team Europe, and also helped me a lot during the way in NFL Europe. A great coach, great person, great individual. Um, so he was the head coach there. I actually called him before and asked if he needed a linebacker, but he, they were stacked. He said, uh, we can't afford you or something like that. I can't really remember. <laughs> but they were stacked. So Kiel could... Uh, uh, well, it wasn't much, but they, they helped. You 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 could have you must have been a like in Europe a hot ticket item for your JFL teams. I don't know, man. Because <clears throat> you counted as a Swedish, not a U.S. import. Exactly, I had an E on my helmet, not an A. So that's a bonus for them. Yeah, I had an issue with that as well. I didn't want to like, be an exemption still when I was <laughs> back in Europe. When I'm back yeah. home. I should be, you know. I'm put that. Yeah. On my so when it when it was uh, when said, it was all said and done, like were you were you happy with your journey? No. Oh no. No man. I was I was bitter. I was angry. I was mad. Um, I was really like not happy with myself. Not you know being better and not uh, just making an NFL team for real. I had some tough years, man. Uh, it was. It was a bunch of years ago now. I mean, I'm 41 now. I stopped playing. I mean, can't even do the math. I think I played my last game when I was 28. So that's right. 13 years ago now. That's a whole teenager ago. And uh, it's a couple of rough years. I had big issues uh, converting or getting into like yeah. a regular life or whatnot. And really like coming, making amends with uh, me not making it as as my goals or you know getting a 
real NFL deal, staying with a team for more than a season, um, playing in a regular season game. It was, uh, yeah. I had some rough years, man. So I was not happy. What was the biggest help for you to like to get over that? Like, not get over it, but like, did you do other stuff? Did you get new hobbies? <laughs> Ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, to get over it, like when I really realized I had an issue with it, which took a couple of years, uh, very stubborn. Mm -hmm. So therapy, really going through like everything and just trying to find a new identity and not identifying yeah. as a football player or like just getting rid of the bitterness, um, seeing like the good stuff and the fun things that I did and experienced, uh, but there comes a moment, you know, where where football or whatever sport you're practicing isn't longer your hobby, right? I mean, there comes a point when it's so serious and it's elite and it's is not it's fun, don't get me wrong, but it's it's real work. And um it kind of transforms to something different than the thing where, you know, like, you're just kind of laughing in the locker room and, you know, everybody's smelling bad. And, you know, when you're in Sweden, you know, somebody's wearing the same helmet that it's been wearing for like 10 years and they probably got like 300 concussions. And you're like watching the concussion movie and thinking like, oh, shit. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you're just having fun. It's not like no, no goal about it, really. And, it's, and when it's elite, it's more, even though it's a team sport at that level, is still an individual effort since it's so individual what you do so because some say one of the other podcasts and interviews they say like <clears throat> the college and nfl and stuff it's it's too much of a business so sometimes you forget like that you actually love this game but coming back to europe like you refall refall in love with the game because it's so simple yeah, I can see that for sure. It's really simple. And I had that kind of re be falling in love again when I played with the national team the last time. Uh, I didn't play my best football then either, but I was having a really good time. Uh, it was really fun. But um, I mean, I think also if you come like to teams to actually win the Super Bowl, I don't think necessarily it's because they have more fun, but, but they always become a team and it's always about the individuals and how they come together and the group atmosphere. If you've ever been a pet part of a winning team, it's not because you have like all the stacked athletes and they're all the best and all that good stuff. I have a theory actually that like, there was a, like a kind of trend when I came back from NFL to for European teams to really try to get NFL talent. But, you don't want NFL talent at that level. You want like a division three, division four, whatever, college player that got freaking horns grown out of their head, just being freaking angry they didn't make it, and just slay people in the European league. You don't want the NFL guy that like kind of had other dreams, and now has to settle for and for European league. You want like people that wanted to make the NFL didn't get drafted and really want to be there they want to be a part of your team and they really want to make an effort to to get the team the team better they don't they don't think it but it's about them and they you know they make the team better and they they play better usually because if you've been to the very top and you had to like back up and go back a couple of steps and be a part of a, a much a league that's not as good as not a, as competitive I mean, it's fairly national to feel like you, you belong somewhere else. Um, so, yeah, I think it's... Uh, for European teams, I think that you should, you know, focus on more talent that hasn't been to the top and really people that want to be there and not trying to be somewhere else. This theory has been said more than one coach, what I've heard, because they say, like, high-talented players like D1, they expect too much. Yeah. <laughs> well, obviously they should. I mean, that's their persona personality, that's the level they played at, and it's just pretty much just psychology. I mean, like if you if you've been at a certain level and you regress, 
uh, you probably if you don't if you're not like that you have to be really really in tune with yourself and really mature and I, I mean a guy or any person but usually men below the age of 25 don't really have that so if they ever had like top level and they have to go back they still always want to try to get there you know but you I mean I really think that that's a thing like don't try to get people that really want to be there and that pertains to any level really <clears throat> well, when you came back to Sweden you, you thought I'm not playing for Stockholm again or did you hang up the shoes for me there's no comeback planned no because you, you look like you still work out <laughs> thank you sir <laughs> yeah I, I do work out it's therapy for me I do I love my morning workouts I'm really I'm not social when I lift um, I really want to work out alone and I don't want anybody to talk to me ever um, and uh, I just want to do my thing because uh, pretty much you know some people meditate uh, I get too much thoughts coming to me when I meditate I tried several times a lot of people swear by meditation but my meditation comes from fatigue when I'm tired and I can't even you know try to think of anything that's where I get like my yeah. meditation and whatnot like that's when I make my like contemplations and you know decisions when I'm physically so tired that I cannot think and I can't do that with anybody else like I can't join CrossFit class when everybody's doing <laughs> high fives and shit I, I can't handle it <laughs> I just try to I would just be too competitive yeah. and I would just you know break my elbow or something because I'm too old so I just need to do my own little thing, my own little square, and keep going what I'm doing. And uh, no, so no comeback. And yes, I work out. Thank you for asking. <laughs> yeah. So we cannot convince you to make a comeback. No. <laughs> very firm, very firm and direct. It's, yeah. Very no. firm. You're very I, sure. I, I like it. Maybe we can do like a Swedish all-star game with all older players play like a not flag football <laughs> game but... but like a video game <laughs> no no no, <laughs> no like a, let's do a Madden, annual Madden tournament game. let's do that <clears throat> were you I'm ever not on putting a on a helmet again do you know like <clears throat> I have some old VSR force home I can go get one and they're like you know if I put that on my head I get a headache for 10 hours I mean I know I've been wearing the new Rydell speeds and whatnot but like Seriously, I no. Yeah, I, I think it, I can't even I can't even step on a football field anymore and play within the regulations. Like I don't even know if European football has the same rules and NFL and whatnot. I don't even know. But when I was you, taught, you can't hit anymore. Football, no, you, you, you can barely but you hit can, anymore. But I was taught that the head was a weapon and you use it. Oh, and that's the same that I played in NFL Europe and in NFL. They called my coach, uh, Winston Moss, with the Green Bay Packers. He was a linebacker coach back then. He would say, put your hammers down and put your hammers on. Like, if you would take your helmet off, he would say, hammer. Because you used your fucking hammer. It's used language. And you put it back on and you use it. You use your head to get separation and that's how you play. But that's not yeah. how you're allowed to play anymore. I wouldn't even, like, the, the movement pattern and the muscle memory, I mean, I would get a concussion after two seconds where I would get somebody else a concussion. <laughs> it doesn't even matter. Yeah, so. Somebody's concussed. It's, it's called self-preservation and knowing thyself. It's like, no, no way. I would get so many flags, and not because I'm a dirty player in my measures, because nothing that I yeah. used to do is allowed. Now you're supposed to put your head... You cannot the tackle a quarterback now. Yeah, yeah. you can probably eject it for three years if you tackle a quarterback the, yeah. <laughs> the way you I used would, to. I would get ejected right away. Can we discuss the dark side of the NFL? Yes, go uh, ahead. The concussion protocol, what was it? Do you see two well, fingers? Actually, uh, back in, um, there was pretty much no, if I remember correctly, when I, they started doing a lot more rigorous concussion protocols when I in 07 
when I was with the Packers, they uh, did a baseline test way back then, and then it got more and more for every year. It got more uh, uh, precarious or more thorough when I was was with the Bengals, and then I just saw it from obviously from the outside getting harder and harder. Um, but I mean. Before that, I don't really think, before like 07, I don't think they were really hard on it. I remember like with the with Dallas, I mean, I mean, pretty much, I mean, our head coach then, I mean, Parcells, I mean, even then he was old and he was old school. I mean, he, I mean, it wasn't really part of it. Like, I obviously the trainers and everything, it worked for everybody's health. I really, really, really want to clear about that, but I don't really believe until it came outside pressure that they focused on it more uh, and I know they started focusing on it in 07 because uh, they started doing baseline tests before the season and if somebody got a concussion they checked them out and you know but not as it is today today is really rigorous <laughs> like I mean is rigorous even a word in English right? no no, it, no it's, it's a word, word you're in English. yeah you're good nice <laughs> I'm using it Fairly, not, fairly advanced word yeah. out of that. No, but um, but obviously, like, as it pertains to the dark side, I think painkillers. Uh, mostly what I saw, and also the guys that are, like, not supposed to play, but pl are playing and know it, and they get injured, like a free agent that didn't get drafted and all of a sudden there's like two injuries before him and uh, he gets to be the starter uh, he's not gonna step off the field and he's gonna ask for the cortisone shot right in his Achilles and obviously that Achilles tendon is gonna pop later on mm. but he doesn't care because it's his only shot and he he cannot get injured um, and uh, obviously there's a moral thing in that like the player himself would say like I need this do this to me and the trainers shouldn't do it but obviously it's a business and they do it anyway so I'm not gonna throw anybody under the bus because if that was me I would have got a cortisone shot in every joint in my body if I would have had a possibility to play one yeah. NFL snap so we talked to a D1 player he said like I'm literally living up li living off tape and painkillers sometimes oh was he still playing <clears throat> yeah, he's still playing. Yeah, because the only year where I was living off painkillers was with Dallas, and obviously I wasn't playing games. But since my goal was to make the team, and the inside linebackers were taller than me and bigger than me, I'm only six foot on a good day, so I need to gain a lot of mass. So I went from like, what was it, two? 230 to 260 wow. during that season. What's that and, in kilos? Um, you do the math. Five. Five. I'll do the math for you. 30, I think. Maybe. 230. So about 105 to... So 105 kilos to 118 kilos during the season. But I was lifting really heavy, like I was lifting and I was eating everything. So I really wanted to be an inside linebacker for Dallas Cowboys playing in that 3-4 scheme. So I really tried to gain weight and I, my frame couldn't handle it. And my I had pain everywhere mostly, in my knees and my shoulders. So I, I had a favorite, it was called Pain Off. And it was uh, uh, aspirin and caffeine combined. So you got a little kick as well, wow. so I was on those all the time um, but I could get off of those later on because I since when I got back when I was with Dallas and I got back to Amsterdam the first thing they said to me why are you so big so <laughs> then I needed to, to drop weight and then when I got to Green Bay they said like because Nick Barnett was a starting linebacker then and he was like 220 on a good day like he was not big but he was strong and he was explosive and he was fast he was one of the most explosive players I ever witnessed in real, real life um, so I needed to drop even more weight when I was Green Bay and then my joint felt better again so then I could get off the painkillers but uh, I would say the most which I, which I saw uh, which uh, was the painkillers and all the like 
pain management around like because you beat up your body really really bad um but the thing is this i mean i'm trying to be kind of nice but still not i'm trying to be fluid correct but um nobody there signed up to be pain-free mm. everybody's there to play football and everybody who's ever played a, stepped on a football field know that it's gonna you, you're gonna have yeah. pain uh, in some way, shape, or form. Sometimes it's better. Sometimes you have great seasons and you never really get injured or you don't have to play injured. You're just having a great season and uh, you don't get hurt. I mean, you're, anything really. Sure, you're sore after the day after the game, but nothing really. But some years you're hurt all the time. Like all, it doesn't really matter. It just moves around. You you you, you sprain your ankle. You you bust up a shoulder. You you tear a pectoral. You you tear up a meniscus. You you have some neck issues. You have concussions. Like everybody signed up for that. Everybody that's on that league in NFL, the very top level, signed up for that. Yeah. So I don't. I'm not gonna like say it's that I feel sorry for any NFL player any shape or form everybody's there on their free will so obviously player safety is really important and you should really think about and you know focusing on on like if somebody gets injured for real like light threatening or like uh, any concussion they should not play but like everybody's in pain so obviously you need some kind of pain management because nobody wants to play with pain and uh, no. It's still a contact sport. Like you cannot do the do it. Like somebody's gonna hurt, get hurt. I mean, I mean, there's done a couple of document documentaries like in different language. I can't remember them, but um, any elite sport in any in any any kind of sport, it's elite for a reason, and nobody's elite for a lifetime because it wears and tears on your body, and that's just the really reality of it. Because if you're any any physical sport, where you're the best at something and you're the best in the world your body's not made for that during a, a long duration like you're gonna get beat up and you're gonna get hurt and that's just the the, 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 the being real about it and it's like nothing no way getting around it I think people getting hurt in the bowl tournament ter tournament Oh yeah, you mean that when you get squat down and you throw that little ball, I need to be close to the yeah. smaller ball. They probably get injured. I mean, have you had? I mean, get that ball on a foot. That hurts. Probably, and the shoulder like you, you must be seventy to play, so your shoulder <laughs> and joint are not built. <laughs> they all like have arthritis and stuff. Yeah. You gotta show them a card that you retired to be able to join. Yeah, you bet. You they get some pain management. <laughs> Don't 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 fool yourself. But there's no other sports you're gonna pick up. You you look like you could play paddle. Play what? Paddle. Oh, <laughs> yes, I've tried that. To, to not 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 any contact doesn't float your boat. <laughs> we don't have to talk about what floats <laughs> my boat, but uh, my, uh, the I mean it's fun. I mean it's, it's kind of fun. I I like paddle because. Anybody could do it, and it's really, you could, because tennis, I mean, if you play tennis, I mean, that ball is just going to fly freaking everywhere, and you, eh. at least you're, like, in a confined area, and the ball can't go anywhere. It's kind of fun that way, but it's, um, uh, it didn't, it didn't do it for me, but it is fun. I mean, you can, I can do it, but I'd rather not. <laughs> I so see you still haven't found that. What is your will? Yet. What is your will? What is like? Why do you want <laughs> me to be active in a sport? Can you? Can you just leave me alone? You're, <laughs> you're still, you still have some good years in you. You could dominate division. Well, you could dominate you. the super series. I'm happy that my looks are conceiving that I could actually pass for something being remotely athletic. Thank you very much. <laughs> Don't 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 tickle my ego. So make me think that I'm gonna be able to do anything athletic without getting hurt. <laughs> no, in two weeks. Like, I, get I, I have a bigger issue like years. watching all these like TV shows with former athletes running around like 
messed on as messed that and all stars and stuff and, and imagining that I could do that and win everything. Like, don't make me tickle my ego and think that I could actually do something. So, I need to calm myself down, stay in my lane, and just, you know, lift some weights where appropriate, you know, don't get hurt, staying alive, all that good stuff. But you're kind of still involved in football because of the Seymour thing. Yeah. <clears throat> For sure. So, is it commenting that it's the NFL games, right? Yeah. No, it's not the Super Series, no. <laughs> no, no. It used to be, right? For one year. One more time. It used to be the Super Series, right? Yeah, t uh, yeah uh, I think it was TV4 Play that did it. Wait, uh, I think a couple of years ago, right? They did the Friday yeah. Friday games. Yeah, they used to cover games, and I know that. Yeah. Did, were you a part of that or no? No, I was not. Because I was with, uh, when they did that, I was with uh, Via Play. Because, uh, I mean, the, the rights was... Uh, Seymour bought the rights this year. Before uh, Via Play had it for like 13 or 14 mm. years. So I switched nice. employer. Who? How, how do you get that kind of job? Because <laughs> I don't think there's an application in Arbitsfamilien for that. Arbitsfamilien. No, there's no Arbitsfamilien for that. See, first you kind of try to become a professional athlete and then you fail at that and then you come home and then they're gonna start a studio with NFL and then you have a friend that works with it and remembers that you're back in Sweden and uh, his name is Erik Stenborg, thank him and you get to get there and you come and you have an audition uh, you make a mock studio or whatever and they tape it and then they evaluate that and they get back to you and offer a job or not how many other applications did they get? Like, how many former NFL players did they interview? For me, it was only me. <laughs> so I didn't have that much competition. So you didn't have to compete. That, that thing you didn't have to compete for. Well, and I had to put an effort, you know, to put up my, my fantastic <laughs> personality and stuff, you know. That's not easy. Any final? Should, oh, the guest questions. I mean, are they really needed? Yeah, this, this has been a great no, interview. I, think, like, I don't want to know. I think it's too good yeah. to destroy it yeah, with yeah, some yeah, random sure. questions. But, uh... We, we usually ask some guest questions. Do you want to take part of them or... Just leave them? Just, I mean, I have time. Just go, man. <clears throat> okay, I, I can take... You can edit it out. You look, you look skilled <laughs> enough. You look like a skilled editor. I'm, I'm, you have, I'm you, have <laughs> you have medals behind you. <laughs> I'm a gold medalist, actually. Yeah, I see that. I noticed. Uh, yeah. Now we had successful years in the, in the junior program. We played in Division One, so it's not that well. Wow. The medal. <laughs> question, question number one. What is your favorite football concept? Concept. Yeah, like blitz routes, uh, play. Oh, I see. I see. Uh, that's a great question. Mm. Well, I kind of, I, I perform best in the 4-3 system. I also perform fairly well in the 4-2-5, five, but that's pretty much the same thing. Um, but I really liked, uh, I liked um, zone coverage. Um, didn't really matter what kind of zone coverage. Um, but I liked the, the, the intricacies of like analyzing before the snap like pre and post motion and you know analyzing the, the, the opponent the offense and stance and receivers and their gimmicks what they do when it's a pass play and not um, I really like the concept of like a 4-3 I like the concept uh, just because I know in and out I played it in three years in in Amsterdam and also Green Bay had it and uh, also the Bengals played a 4-3 so I'm really I've played it a lot and been under a lot of good coaches that have coached it, so I enjoy it a lot and I enjoy that concept. Four, three. Yeah. Okay, second question. What is your favorite football uniform? Any, like, college, NFL, Sweden, Germany, <coughs> Netherlands? The most, like, honestly, like, the most... 
I mean, we had some emotional games with the national team. We had, we're a bunch of guys, you know, playing together and pretty much the same age. And we won the European Championship on Swedish soil back in 2005. So those uniforms always has a really nice place in my heart. Uh, also, like Tabby growing up, I mean, played there for like when I was 13 to, to 19. We had some really ugly ones through the years, but they, you know, they sparked my emotional side. Uh, as a, I mean, I really enjoy playing with Amsterdam. So they all, I mean, I have so many favorites. Like, but when it comes to pure looks, I tend to like the darker ones. Um, I like it when it's like, I really like the color rush ones that they, the NFL started with, yeah. more like college looking ones. Uh, when with the matte colors, I like those. This one is a two part question. Shoot. <clears throat> What is the least skillful position in football? <laughs> I'm struggling not to say O-line, but uh, <laughs> it's probably the most skilled position because it's always fun to make fun with O-linemen. Uh, the least skilled position in football. Does it, mm -hmm. yeah. can it be any position? Yeah. What? Wide receiver. <laughs> oh, I got you. <laughs> they just run in there. You know, waving their hands. I was say, I was no, I'm just joking. <laughs> to be honest, it's probably like some. I mean, seriously, like they don't even allow that anymore, so it's an outdated answer. But honestly, like wedge. Are you guys old enough yeah. to actually know what a wedge is? Yeah, I'll I'm be 21. So I just yeah, want to mention that. Yeah. All right, Antoine knows. Yeah. OJ, you don't the know. kid. <laughs> See, before, back in the day, when you play special teams, it's called <laughs> kickoff, kickoff return. On the kickoff return team, they would allow the biggest guys on the freaking field to form a three to five man wedge <laughs> to protect the returner. So they would back up, make a meat wedge, and just run straight down the field together hand to hand. That, that doesn't demand sick. any skill whatsoever. Yeah. It just takes courage. <laughs> I don't think it's legal that, anymore, that. to be honest. No, no, <laughs> oh, no, man. not legal. So yeah, that didn't matter. Most, what is the most skillful position? Most skillful position? I mean, you can't count quarterback because that's just boring. Obviously, you not need a lot of skill to play quarterback, but that's just fine-tuned skill. When it comes to, as I mentioned before, I was most impressed when I came to the NFL with the O-linemen and the cornerbacks. And I would like to say cornerbacks because I've seen so many really good defensive uh, backs that just defy the laws of gravity and just common sense. Because it's like a combination of, because they're playing, like just to put some band-aid on that wound I gave you, Antoine, uh, they're playing against yeah. some of the fastest players on the field. And they are really athletic and they can jump really high. And you... You know, you're going up against not only a wide receiver, but a quarterback that, in, in the best of cases, mm -hmm. have like pinpoint precision. So they don't need much more than an arm length to make a completion. So to actually be able to have a shutout as a cornerback against a wide receiver is really, really hard. Especially with rules in football as they are today. You can't pretty much touch a receiver yeah. where, wherever they are or any kind of tight end or whatnot. So. I would say cornerback. Um, I cannot say safety because then my colleague and friend Philip Minya <laughs> would get his ego boosted. So I would. I love the guy. I love him so much, but you know his ego. I love that. <laughs> he doesn't one. need that. He needs. I love him, <laughs> and he's a great safety. Used to be. He's retired as well. Yeah, he blocked one of Ula Kimrin's kicks. Actually, yeah, he did. Yeah, Ula oh, didn't mention that. Is uh. Ooh, like I mean, he brought it up, that. so probably. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he has to have his feelings <laughs> hurt. That's sure. Okay, we got some. Do you want to ask your question, um, Like, when did you fall in love with American football? <laughs> yeah. 13. 13. Yeah. Well, honestly, I need to get, put some meat on that, but before I actually ever put on a pair of pads. I watched a college 
football movie called The Program. Yeah, I, haven't, no, I haven't seen it, I don't think. Yeah, you need to see that. Pretty much it's everything that football okay. is not today. So it's, it's pretty much a movie that depicts uh, the dark side of football mm. within college. But yeah, also the they have all, all, one more time. When the center passed out with concussions or something. I think you're thinking about something else. I think you're yeah. thinking about more politically correct movie. No, this is this is like they they show everything. There's like the college player getting paid on the table. They watch you know womanizing, nice cars, they uh, everything, and also like the backside. They use they show steroid use. They show show everything, and you know all the hard hitting, yeah. head to head, all that good stuff. Uh, so I saw that movie and always you know was really attracted to all the hard hitting. Um, so I watched that first, and that was like kind of what kind of piqued my interest. Uh, and then uh, when I got to do my first practice, I was just like, "Yep, this is this is it, this is for me." I asked the coach the first day, like, "Where can I buy pads?" And he said, "Maybe <laughs> you can borrow some to start with." <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, so I fell nice. in love with the nice. first practice awesome. actually. What is your favorite position position in football besides your own? When I was with the Packers, also with the Cowboys, but uh, when I was with the Cowboys, I the first like regular practice after training camp, uh, I was during the warm up. It, we were in Texas, back in Texas again, after leaving from California, and and um, one of the trainers or actually equipment guys come over to me, and he says, "When is the defensive first team? Look for me, and I got this jersey for you." And I was like, "What do you mean?" And he said. Because you're going to be scout fullback. So I went both ways, obviously. It was kind of tiresome, but being a practice squad, you're on the practice squad, obviously. So you get to be the look team board for the offense and defense. So you always go up against the the, the, the offensive number one and defensive number one. Uh, so I was usually mostly the fullback with Dallas. When I got with Green Bay, uh, I was fullback and also a lot of tight end during practice. So me and Aaron Rodgers were... You know, since he was the second team, he was obviously the second team look quarterback. Uh, it was a lot of fun, uh, mostly because he was a great quarterback, uh, but also a really nice dude. But uh, me and another guy, I think he also signed later on, became but we were two linebackers. Spencer Havener was his name. I think he actually was with, was with Green Bay when they won the Super Bowl in 2010. Him and me, we went like, you know, we were backup linebackers, so we were, you know, Linebackers, tight ends, linebackers, all, all the time you know, during all practice. And I really fell in love with the tight end position. Uh, also with, with Dallas, I thought it was really fun watching Jason Witten back in the day, like how's his, how his route technique. Like he wasn't the fastest guy, but he could always make himself open. Uh, so I really enjoy watching the tight end. <coughs> There's no quick answers. <laughs> I make a story out of everything. Best player you have played against? That's a tough one because I have to relate to like actually playing real live snaps to like. It doesn't have to be an actual game. You can practice against an awesome running back, quarterback. <clears throat> uh, I would say with instead of against. Um, I was thoroughly impressed, I mean, with Nick Barnett, uh, up, uh, linebacker, middle linebacker in, in Green Bay. i never seen another player being able to, like usually a player has like one hit in them, and then say for example, that the clear example I can give you is like a linebacker taking on an old lineman or a linebacker or a fullback, uh, any kind of blocker and then tackling the, the the ball carrier like usually the first pop against the the, the old lineman or, or fullback is hard and then he just kind of a, a, a player usually just slips off and can't recoil and hit again really hard but he had the c capacity to like hit something really hard and shock a fullback or your old lineman and then when the ball carrier came he could recoil and hit him as hard i haven't really seen that ever like really it was really impressive i would okay nick barnett 
best team you ever played against? Played against. Could be one of the NFL Europe teams. I think the second year we we played uh, Frankfurt three times. Uh, during the regular season, we beat them twice, and then we met them in the World Bowl and lost. It was really tight fights. It was always really hard. They ran the ball a lot. They had a great running back. They called him the Rabbit. Can't really remember what he was what he was called. And they also had a great fullback. And I'm dropping their names right now. Can't remember them. But they were really good. They had a great old lineman as well. They had a center that was always talking <laughs> trash. It's pretty funny. We were actually see I'm you know I'm Swedish from Europe, and we were playing and and he was trying to you know get me mad and he was gonna say something, you know bad to me and he said, explicit like uh, explicit thing like effing foreigner, so I turned around and I'm like, you're, <laughs> never mind and he was like, realized yeah. so like oh yeah I'm I'm the foreigner, <laughs> we're all foreigners, out. Uh, that was fun. It was a good time. Yeah, I would say, like, Frankfurt, we had some really hard fights during the years. No. Any good episode. Thoughts, thoughts, good episode. Thank you for thank you for coming on. Thank you for uh, spending, uh, you know, spending all this time with us and sharing your story and your journey. Uh, and uh, most importantly, thank you for your honesty. Uh, a lot of people try to sugarcoat uh, a lot of things, but I think you were very genuine and very honest uh, with your experience. So definitely appreciate it. I appreciate that, Christian. The opportunity. Next time, they'll just tell me that we're gonna be like, you know, showing our face. I would have done, you know, I have the whole TV makeup here. Actually, you know, got the nice webcam out, you know. But uh, otherwise, thanks a lot, man. It's it's been fun. It's been great fun. I can't believe it's been 90 minutes and I've been talking all the time, pretty much. So, appreciate that. <clears throat> You have you've been recommended, so I yeah. think this is an episode people have been waiting yeah, yeah. for. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm recommended now. Don't want you now. walk around with too big of a head Thank now. You. But yeah, yeah. Hot ticket yeah. item. You're you're still you're <laughs> yeah, still yeah. lobbing for that comeback now, aren't you? <laughs> I thought that shut it down, but you need to finish up with that, huh? If you come back, you come. If you come out of retirement, where am I supposed to come, come back though? Where should I even go? I think every <laughs> single team in Sweden would gladly take you. Yeah. <laughs> AIK is almost tabby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But they don't have a senior though. Then I have to go with like their. I don't even want to take the, that name in my mouth. What kind of team that their seniors playing? I mean, I can't even discuss that. <laughs> the rivalry is still alive. Yeah, there used to be another team that you know it was Swolna Chiefs, and uh, you know, yeah. can't. We don't say the names out here. Yeah. Thank you very much and thank you for listening, people.